this work I will be talking today, I will try not to draw much connection to the current situation. It is a work in the history of Russian political and geographic thought of the late 19th century, early 20th century. So how much can we draw, we will see. But just to start, it's definitely important to acknowledge some people and some help I have received in this past two years of uh, working on this highly theoretical and historical project. I worked at the Vyshka National Research University Higher School of Economics in Moscow. My postdoctoral fellowship was um, funded quite generously by the Horizon 2020 initiative. And also my exchange with Cardiff University to work with my co-author Oleg Golubchikov, a great a colleague of mine was possible uh, due to Erasmus Plus uh, fellowship as well. And of course, the Russian State Library has to be on the slides everywhere because as Russian scholars, we do rely quite a lot on its um, resources. So the talk very much is based on this long project that Oleg and I have started from our own curiosity to understand what Russia thinks of the spatial relations of power, right? How we theorize them and therefore how we legit legitimize different ways of taking over geographical space or taking over a piece of land. So this very much comes from a very um, standard and familiar to all of us idea of territory, right? And territory in the Anglo-Saxon, in the Eurocentric scholarship often draws on quite a um, significant body of knowledge about borders and state sovereignty. Territory often acts as a bounded sovereign space under the control of a person or a group of people. So most characteristics of territory usually imply that we have to study different ways in which political power organizes or encloses or orders and regulates geographic space. Well, Russia, on the other hand, sorry, there you go, had a very long and contested love-hate kind of affair with the Eurocentric idea of territory. So the relationship with territory in Russian sense is very complicated. State-led projects for cadastral land mapping or for redivision and forced appropriation of land have been always met, not always, but often met with resistance. And we can trace it back to history. And there are some emblematic examples, like for example, Bulavin uh, rebellion against the forced state encroachment on autonomous lands of Don Cossacks in 1708, or Pugachev rebellion taking over territorial and over territorial autonomy between Volga and the Urals right in 1773. So we have a long contested relationship with borders and long contested relationship with uh, sovereignty as well, as we know from the situation that is happening today currently in Ukraine. So some of these claims, of course, have been grounded very much in the rich tradition of Russian political geography, political science, and in general, philosophic thought that have used different categories of spatial analysis to describe the ways Russia deals with space. So we have theorized space quite widely. And um, most often, the scholars of Russia, Russian scholars, have described territory in opposition to the Eurocentric idea of territory, right? Russian space is this vast space that is spanning across Eurasia, right? That consumes all other territories and nations under its own force. So power in the Russian political context have often been interpreted, have often interpreted geographical space as something that is infinite and unlimited, right? This is the classical way of Russian <laughs> political geography, right? The tendency to spatial bordering was often perceived as quite foreign and as borrowed from abroad in the scholarship, right? In the political geographical traditions and lineages. So for example, 
the most caricature example would be right Russian far-right political analyst Alexander Dugin talking about the vastness of Russian territory and talking about the prime quality of the Russian space is its size. And here I quote Dugin from his book in 2011, Russian space is always a large, great space. By far, not all peoples and not all societies imagine space like this, but the Russians see it precisely as endless, vast, infinite, and lacking within the limits of visibility, <laughs> it's an important point here, concrete borders. So the tendency to spatial bordering, which means the tendency to understanding territory in the Western sense, have often been perceived as something not Russian. This uh, quite often as well resulted in the so-called Russian spatial anxiety, right, the idea that the power mechanisms to defend the frontier of our nation are obviously not so sufficient, right? The bordering will not help out because the space is so vast. So this resulted in the kind of divergent perspectives on territory from the inability of political technologies to stratify geographic space, leaving it absolutely agile on, or empty intentionally to the unlimited implementation of pretty direct violence that has compensated for this technological insufficiency with the assertion of macro technologies of power. So we have been going back and forth right between leaving space empty or really intentionally occupying that space rather than simply bordering and enclosing the space from the outside. So Pyotr Chadaev, a uh, Russian philosopher and an intellectual of the 20th, uh, early 19th century, has famously said that our whole history is the history of a product of the nature of this vast land that we have inherited. It was she who scattered us in all directions and scattered in space from the very first days of our existence. So we have seen this different kind of political technologies applied to space, again, throughout many historical events in Russia, from the ability for free settlers to just freely and chaotically occupy the Russian space, essentially in the East, right, in Siberia, starting around the 1880s, to the direct implementation of force and violence towards some of the Cossack communities in the south where they essentially were forced to settle along the roads and along the rivers in the Russian south in order to defend it. So in the Russian space, the fixation of power have often been done through peopling rather than bordering, right? And through localization of force rather than through bordering. Therefore, the erection of different support points, such as fortresses or cordons or outposts or ostrogs or small mere communities that have collectively uh, worked their land in small enclosed kind of areas was the point uh, behind Russia's um, relations of power. So the attachment of this controlled subject to the soil restricted their, uh, their spontaneous movement once they have moved and populated the, populated the land. So the technologies here are quite different from just simply bordering and enclosing the space. So the goal of our project was the following. We were trying to explore uh, how adopting and modifying or outright rejecting the Western idea of territory in Russia's philosophical movements, right? We have engaged with the history of Russian philosophical thought, really, really legitimized different modes of spatial appropriation, some other modes of spatial appropriation, and also use different spatial vocabularies to describe the political appropriation of space, not so much territory. So what we have done, we have returned to a number of classic studies in political geography 
we looked at the periodicals of the Russian Geographical Society. We looked at the influential works, influential works in political theory and geography, as well as, of course, we reflected on the most recent writings on the Russian territorial relations of power. So the contribution was essentially twofold. First, we want to bring territory into the Russia debate because we think that territorial, politi territorial politics is central to Russia's exercises of power, just like Eric has said in the beginning. However, a critical use of analytical frames to explore territory in Russia in a critical way have been rarely applied in Western academia. And secondly, we will try to bring Russia into the territory debate. So we will try to understand what is the special Russian, Russian conceptual apparatus for understanding the spatial relations of power and how it draws on an upper, a number of different um, concepts such as land and soil and terrain and landscape and narod or the people in order to contribute to the Western theory and Western political geography. So what we have done, we essentially discovered kind of three general lineages in understanding of territory. The first one is the idea so much drawn from the philosophical movements of Slavophilism and Pochvinichistvo, which means the return to the native soil movement, quite popular in the late 19th century. Uh, their idea of territory was that territory is cultivated from the soil in a collective. It, um, in geographical terms, it sustains and shapes this organic state speciality that knows no border for expansion. The second um, facet of territory we discovered was, of course, the classical study right, of Russian Eurasianism and Neo-Eurasianism that very much draws on the idea of a terrain and landscape. So in this um, direction, territory is ingrown from the terrain. It gathers the surrounding lands and peoples into this one massive ethnographic multitude. And we can also imagine, right, it doesn't so much respect actual physical borders. And the last one, of course, is probably the most familiar to us all. The last facet of territory draws very much from Zapadnichistvo or Westernism and modernity, modernism, the Russian early 20th century uh, philosophers, and political scientists and geographers who brought in more familiar understanding of territory in terms of the establishment of hierarchical units for rational redistribution of resources. And here we look at the Soviet projects of scientification and development as well. So if you try to go briefly through each of them, we will see that each of these traditions very much grounded in a specific uh, lineage in the history of political and geographical thought. It uses specific spatial categories to describe these relations of power, but also it results in different ways of justifying and legitimizing other forms for the appropriation of space. And here we can start with the first one, right, the draws on soil, land, and narod, and the ideas of pochvinichistvo and Slavophilism. And this tradition very much relies on a rich experience of the Russian Mir. Amir was a redistributional land commune that started around the 14th century and appropriated land in the pursuit of some kind of autonomy from the state. Others would argue, no, Mir was a state project of attaching peasants to the land. Anyway, the fact was the peasants worked collectively, cultivated the soil collectively, and could never imagine the soil becoming private property. So this customary practice of land management gave rise to some interesting uh, ideas in Pochvinichistvo, in the Slavophilism movements. For example, Vasily Leshkov, uh, 
the famous um, Slavophile have said that the Russian land commune was an embryo of Russian public institutions. It gave up some interesting ideas to the establishment of the idea of a Russian nation state. The communal ownership offered mere full power over its lands. So not only the right of ownership or dominion, but also imperium over its people. And we know from international relations, dominion and imperium are both quite crucial concepts behind the idea of territory. Pishihonov also argued in 1907 that Mir had its own territorial integrity to fulfill and was able to fulfill governmental functions. And yet it also embodied democratic principles of self-government and autonomy. Well, the idea of the Russian land commune and the practice of the Russian land commune give this rise to a new territorial imaginary Territorial imaginary of the median world, or what the Russians say, Sredinny Mir. This was a concept developed by um, Lamansky, one of the famous um, Slavophiles of the Russian Empire, to describe a unique Russian world, a unique all Slavic world based on the ownership of all Slavic soil, implying the expansion of the state as an organic process grounded in the century-old Slavic tradition. And we can obviously see here some interesting connection to the Russian forms of colonization and expansion. Because as Lamansky have also mentioned, median world knows no rules of land repartitioning. Uh, it is united and the borders of this median world extend far beyond the Russian frontiers. So here, territory emerges as something um, of a massive colonial kind of imperial entity of the Slavdom and its collective ownership of all Russian soil. If we keep going and refer to the ideas of terrain and landscape and the practice of Russian Eurasianism, then we encounter a very different story. Here we see that in the Eurasianist thought, the early 20th century, territory emerges as this dynamic material substract rather than fixed spatial extent. Russia, in the Eurasianist thought, as we all know, is interpreted as the Eurasian country, formed as an organic fusion of different ethnic forms of European and Asiatic roots, nurturing not so much a Slavic nation state, just like the Slavophiles have done, but very much a Russian super ethnos, something that still influences our action in relation to geographical space today. So this idea of territory as a Eurasian massive super ethnos was grounded in an interesting concept, the concept of Mesta Razvitia, or in English it would be place development. This concept was developed by uh, Pyotr Savitsky, a famous Russian Eurasianist, a father of Eurasianism, to essentially distinguish the idea of Mestrasvitya from territory. So from this sense, uh, from this kind of tradition, Russian destiny is to master geographical space. Because if it's controlled properly, it will generate new energy. And so place development was very much drawn from the German anthropogeographic tradition of Lebensraum or Friedrich Ratzel, right? The idea of a living space, of the constant expansion and the organic processes of state formation. So geopolitics from this standpoint, as Konstantin Chkheidze, a Russian geographer, geographer have put it, is interested in the, in the population, not in terms of its belonging to a single political entity, but in terms of its, its creative capabilities, right? Mestre Zvitya means constantly growing and expanding and nurturing the connection of people to the terrain and to the landscape. It's a very interesting tradition. We can spend years and years, as others do, studying Eurasianists ideas of territory and space.
last but not least was, of course, this idea of state-led projects of the appropriation of space. And this is a Soviet idea, right? This is an early Soviet idea of rational distribution of resources. So for the first time in history, we actually looked at this shift from the borderless um, expansion of the nation state to towards a defensive communist state that somewhat has some borders, but more so it has a very strict hierarchy of different locations and different units of production. Here, of course, we have Lenin's idea of the nationality politics, rendering different nationalities as territorial, territorially enclosed units. Here we have Stalin's policies of expulsion of some ethnic groups to people the steppe frontier. From this perspective, the Soviet spatial world kind of shifts towards more economically pragmatic understanding of territory. This is for the first time we see something quite similar that we can actually wrap our, our head around. So space here is not so much conceived as the source of um, growth and expansion right from landscape and terrain but as a source of collective production enclosed within the system of economic uh, planning central economic planning and as mark mirovich a famous planner and architect has put it this new system of economic zoning and division of space into proletarian cores emerged for the first time in early Soviet geography. So the anchors of, of the attachment of labor to the sites of reclamation and process, processing of natural resources were kind of the main idea behind the establishment of territorial course of production. Well, so kind of rushing to finish, uh, territory as we see in the history of Russian political and geographical thought often takes on multiple forms and it often employs very different spatial categories of analysis from soil and narod to landscape and terrain to the unit and hierarchy of space as we see in early Soviet writings. So those strategies are often both state-centered and bottom-up but what is interested, interesting about it is that they try to portray the Russian nation's, nation state space as something organic and constantly expanding. We see some remnants of this story today as well. And in the mid-Soviet Union, we see the expansion of kolkhozes and sovkhozes or collective farm enterprises that very much mixed different ideas from Narodnicestva to Slavophilism, as well as some ideas around the rational distribution of resources to essentially establish collective farm enterprises. We see this happening over and over with Russia annexing Crimea and explaining that this need is justified by the unification of all Slavic Slavdom, right? The Russian, um, the Crimean sheep is coming back to the Russian, um, to the Russian um, borders, right? We see so much drawn from all three political philosophical traditions to justify the expansion of Russia. And most recently, actually, a couple of, um, quite recently, um, we see also the need uh, in Russian government expressed by Sergei Shoigu, who is not only the Ministry of Defense, but also the head of the Russian Geographical Society, which tells a lot. The idea of, um, that he has proposed is that we need to build new centers of attraction, uh, of innovation in Siberia, these new beautiful cities that will try to help us to gather our Russian community um, our Slavic community uh, all across Siberia and to kick up economic production 
So these different ideas are mixed and matched all together. Depends on the situation, right? We just can draw them from a pack, and we can use Eurasianism and Slavophile and Narodnicistva and Pochvinicistva to justify Russia's spatial expansion. So this conceptual toolbox that we have tried to analyze, it is quite relevant today, we argue so, and it also is quite relevant potentially beyond the post-socialist and Eurasian worlds, right? It can also maybe help to possibly escape the analytical trap of territory, right? And look at territory as something more than enclosure of space under the control of a group of people. So we think that Russian geographical scholarship can be put to more progressive ends, even though yet it is quite <laughs> questionable. But bringing it back into Western uh, political geography it will definitely have uh, quite an important comp contribution. So yes, um, this is a brief <laughs> introduction into what we have been working on with Oleg for the past two years. It's still work in progress, but I'm very much looking forward to our discussion and any comments that you have about that. Thank you so much. Questions for Professor Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so uh, very interesting presentation, uh, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, so I had like a couple of questions, so I, I will just ask a couple. Uh, yeah. So first, uh, you mentioned this uh, peopling of territories uh, rather than bordering territories, right? And I was thinking that, yeah, certainly you can think about this uh, in terms of like Eastern territories, mm -hmm. right? Siberia and South, uh, historically. But what about the Western, uh, you know, borders of Russia? I mean, were there like two ideas? That, because obviously Western borders of Russia were much more stable in yeah. a sense compared to the East, right? Because uh, it was a very different geography. So does that mean that Russian philosophers had like two separate ideas for the West and mm -hmm. the East, for example, and South? Uh, that's one question. Mm -hmm. And um, the other question is, like you, uh, I mean, my sense is that uh, your sources primarily, I mean, the early, earlier sources come from the 19th century, which makes sense, of yeah. course, you know, nationalism and all that stuff um, in Europe and gradually coming to Russia in late 19th century and uh, things like this. But uh, the qu my question is, like, uh, is it like, um, do people, do philosophers at that time, thinkers, uh, did they just describe, did they try to rationalize what they were seeing, or their thinking infiltrated the Russian policies <coughs> too? They were, I mean, did they translate into pol actual policies, or they were just purely descriptive that had, you know, trying to rationalize what they were seeing? I mean, yeah. The These are two great questions, and it's so hard to answer because it's not just one discipline of political geography, it's so monotonous. It's extremely complex, right? Borders in the West would be very different from the East. So it depends on the state projects at that time that the Eurasianists and the Slavophiles were trying to justify or explain or theorize this expansion. So that's where we also see it as a problem for this project too, trying to extract some kind of um, single story from this complexity and it's uh, really hard but what we have seen for sure and we're certain about is that Eurasianists obviously were emigrate scholars they were writing from abroad they were publishing in French they were publishing in English knowing what was happening they were reading literature they were leading, reading German geopolitics scholars and they were intentionally trying to build something in opposition to that so we often see these different traditions of spatial analysis as the method of decolonizing ourselves from the West and trying to find our own idea of Russian space, of the nation state. Therefore, yes, they knew what was happening. They were trying to reflect on it and to build something else. 
but quite often that ended, they ended up borrowing some ideas from the German anthropogeographical school as well. And they were trying to mimic those interesting lineages of territory in their writings. So it wasn't so much put to practice, right? But yet it has serious influence on practice. For example, geopolitics has a serious comeback now, as we all know. After the Soviet Union collapsed, geopolitics, it's been taught in the military academy, and it's been taught by some serious far-right scholars of Eurasia, etc., who are picking and choosing different concepts from the history of the early 20th century geographical thought to justify what is happening in Russia today. So where the concept ends and the practice starts, it's a really tough question, and I frankly don't have an answer. But um, we see a lot of intermingling between back and forth. I don't know if it answers <laughs> what you have asked. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question, and I will write down for myself because we haven't come across anything related to the Mediterranean. But I'm sure if we expand our search, we'll definitely find uh, quite a lot. We see a lot is drawn from uh, other German geopolitics scholars, such as Carl Schmidt, talking about the uh, water based and the land soil based civilization. So we see this in uh, the writings of more current Alexan Alexander Dugin, the far right analyst that everybody probably knows. Um, but it just comes off as more conceptual, not so much as a strategy for direct kind of involvement. But it would be very interesting to look back uh, into the early 20th century and see if it comes across. Yeah, because I feel like historically that has always been Russia's like yeah. claim to push, expand the southward, you know, down to from the Straits of Bosphorus to you know warm waters, and not, maybe that's not a universal thing. And yeah. the same to the Mediterranean. Um, another thing that I was curious about, you know, um, thinking about the European state formation, um, have you seen any maybe statistics or information about the density of populations? I realized that. That's a very good point, and 
referring to the European idea of the nation state and its formation that starts right on the paper around the Westphalian world order, Westphalian peace treaties around early 1600s. So at that time, we looked at what Russia has been doing and Russia has been mapping its uh, ecological frontiers with forests and rivers and some sparkles of uh, small communities living somewhere in between. So we were far, far away from identifying, uh, the, from relating to the Westphalian territorial sovereignty idea from that time because it just happened much, much later. So if you draw direct kind of comparison um, from the early 1600s, that is just impossible to do because we are still barely mapping our space on the paper and there is not a single first um, land survey conducted that only is conducted in the 1700s, so a century later. And it's still, it's quite flawed and it has many issues as well because the peasants were not so happy about <laughs> quantifying their own land. And there was just no other means uh, to, to quantify it, to calculate it, like you said, because people are living so scarcely, so far away from each other that every single commune we have seen was using different ways to measure the land, different ways to redistribute the land. And none of them were metric. None of them had any numbers assigned. So it would be just a number of uh, steps or uh, sticks or whatever. So it's a very different story. But the density population, it would be another Thanks. wonderful aspect. Yeah. I have a question from online. Yeah. Uh, How then do thinkers in this tradition deal with the contraction of Russian land? That is, the cession from the Russian polity or the loss of land and people that were once within Russia? Well, it is a painful experience <laughs> for Russians, that's for sure. And um, it, it definitely is a center for the current uh, Putin's narrative about the geopolitics and everybody wants to grab a piece of Russia. Right recently, have, have, he has expressed this um, um, desire to pull away the cloth of those who are going to come and take our land since we are a strong bear and all of that. But yeah, um, I, I haven't found that specifically in our readings, but um, I would assume that Russia has a pretty special place in its heart for all the lost territories. I will definitely look into that uh, in the future. It's a great question. This may be a little bit of a stretch, but I'm curious how the approach to the borders may form um, their uh, approach to some areas that are outside our, the, the normal, uh, for example, the polar cap region or maybe even completely different domains like space. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any connection between those? Yeah, um, depends on probably uh, how deep you want to go into the history, but if you want to refer to, again, the writings of Alexander Dugin, we will see some caricatures, right, which is, uh, again, hodgepodge of all different kinds of nationalist thought and Eurasianist thought and uh, Slavophile thought, but um, directly, I haven't found that in my literature, but I, I, Marlene Laruel has studied quite um, extensively the idea of Eurasianism and the connection of Eurasianism to understanding the cosmos and space. Uh, so that would be an interesting uh, way to look at it. I haven't done so yet, but it's, it's quite fascinating uh, direction to go next. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you for a great talk and a really wonderful overview. Uh, you focused, and I think rightly focused, on, on Russians and uh, Slavs, Slavophiles, who were mainly focused on Russians or, or Slavs in general, except, of course, the Catholic ones, which were kind of seen as a threat. And um, the Eurasianists who acknowledged the diversity of Eurasia to some extent, but also thought Russians should have dominion over over this, this territory largely. Uh, 
And I'm wondering about the, the role of non-Russian and non-Slavic people uh, in, in this imagining of space, mm -hmm. because it seems like there's a lot of contradictions there. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, um, you know, the state is expelling, say, Muslims from the North Caucasus or um, keeping uh, Jewish populations in the Pale of Settlement, which is also sort of along the border. Um, and sort of seeing these, these non-Russian border populations as threats. But on the other hand, they're mobilizing non-Russian groups uh, to expand the dominion of the state uh, or extend it to other territories, you know, for example, the Armenians uh, along the border with, with, uh, with the Ottoman Empire, or Koreans and who were encouraged to settle in the Russian Far East, uh, or, or Germans even before the, in the 18th century. And so I'm wondering um, what role, how these thinkers grapple with non-Russians, because you know, there is, as, as Russia expands, of course, it brings in more and more non-Russian people uh, into its territory, and how is, how, how are they, they sort of factoring into the conversation or, or not factoring into the conversation? This is a great question. Thank you so much, Eric. And um, we see selective choice of what kinds of non-Russians are included in this scholarship that we have read, right? In particular, in the Eurasianist line of thought, this is the whole idea of Eurasia being not just a Slavic um, dominion, but also a more of a vast kind of empire that takes all Turkic and all kinds of Asiatic um, nations and uh, tribes and just submerges them into this massive nation state. But I don't see any particular trends in what exact communities would be considered as what kind of role they would play in this expansion. It's just a giant melting pot of whoever comes on board, please join us and become a part of the Eurasian Union. But again, it only features in the Eurasianist thought, right? In, in early Soviet writings, we can see the nationality politics behind Lenin's uh, idea of to give territorial sovereignty to every single nation as well. But otherwise, if you go earlier into the idea of the behind Russian commune and the peasants working the land, it is all primarily Slavic. So it does change with time, but we don't see, maybe we haven't looked at it in much detail, but we don't see a specific kind of place for different nations in this discourse, which makes it so obscure and which makes it so powerful as well. Yeah. Okay, so I, actually, um, uh, I'm piggyback, uh, piggyback on, on this uh, comment about minorities, um, peripheral minorities, and um, I recall um, Talis Milonas uh, has a book on uh, the differential treatment of minorities, um, and uh, and they found that um, that um, so central states. Uh, uh, treatment of peripheral minority depends on the sponsorship that those minorities have uh, beyond the borders. Basically, you know, so Armenians mm -hmm. are friends because they are against uh, the Ottomans, but for example, um, uh, you know, uh, Circassians in the North Caucasus and uh, West uh, uh, Caucasus. Mm -hmm. uh, they are enemies because they are supported by the Ottomans, right? I mean, and, and uh, mm -hmm. the same uh, goes for other uh, minorities. So, um, so it seems like you know from your presentation, uh, I get the impression that you know this, you know, territory, this thinking of territory and uh, ordering uh, the territory in Russia, it almost like emerges spontaneously and organically, you can say that again and again. But I mean, there seems to be no space, no, no role for the central state. Mm -hmm. um, which, and I'm curious, you know, whether you intentionally left it out or you don't know how to incorporate, mm -hmm. in, incorporate it, or you genuinely believe that the central state had nothing to do with ordering the, the space, you know, whatever uh, it was. Or, you know, maybe there was some sort of combination of both that kind of 
developments uh, that have just happened and the central state reacting to them or something like this. So I was wondering, you know, if you could like, um, you know, respond to uh, the role of the central state. Yeah, it's 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 a great point, and it's probably one of the central points that we are trying to grapple with because this dynamic between mobility and fixation is embedded in everything we have studied. So we, the central state would allow peasants, for example, to freely resettle, right, and go to the east and settle. They could settle anywhere, absolutely, if they could reach, reach it, right, prior to Stalipian reforms of, reforms of 1906, when they were actually forcefully resettled to the east to occupy the frontier with Russian land communes. But at some times, this spontaneous colonization, and it's very much described in the recent book by Alexander Etkind on internal colonization, the spontaneity is abruptly stopped by the state trying to attach the moved subject to the soil. The same happened with Don Cossacks in the South when they were essentially giving land to cultivate. And they are nomadic tribes. They didn't need land to cultivate. But they were given land to cultivate by the state in order to attach them to a specific location that is quite a strategic location along the rivers and the major roads to defend the Russian southern frontier. So the movement and fixation of people, it is essentially a state project, right? When we allow some people to move freely and we abruptly position them in space where we want them to be. So the state plays quite a crucial role there. If you look at the writings of those scholars, and if you just look at history in particular, related to the peasants or to the Don Cossacks in the, sou in the South and their movement and the end of this movement. And that's, that's a really interesting story. I, yeah, it probably didn't come across in a short talk, but in our project, we find a lot of state play in between the free movement versus fixation of people in place. Yeah, it's, a, it's a g another great question. Just out of curiosity, when you're sort of comparing this to a European concept of territory, are you looking at concepts of territory within Europe or European concepts of territory around the world, because of course, you know, this is the age of empire, and so European states might have one way of thinking about territory, you know, say within within France or within uh, within the, the um, within Britain, but then other other gradations of territory in their empires. So there are protectorates and informal, you know, imperial arrangements. And uh, treaties that you know, place mm -hmm. uh, place states, you know, in a, in a hierarchically lower position, but are still you know, kind of considered technically uh, independent uh, kingdoms, and so on. And so, I'm just kind of wondering because you know, what is, of course, so interesting and kind of confusing uh, about Russia is that it's both both a state and an empire at the same time, and sort of the same territory without a clear distinction between the two. And so I'm wondering, you know, what is your sort of European model? And where, where is that coming from? Thanks for this question, because this is what I was supposed to have started with. I didn't have time to go in depth. But by territory, we take on this disciplinary understanding of the concept of territory in the Western kind of Eurocentric thought that is grounded very much in the experiences of the expansion of a European nation state where territory would be attached to the borders and territorial sovereignty. So in the discipl discipline of political geography, that understanding of territory has been debated quite recently. I mean, since the publication by John Agnew on Territorial Trap, talking about that we are trapped in territory. We are trapped in this Anglo-Saxon Western understanding of territory that is grounded in Eurocentric modernity and relations between space and power. So there have been many efforts to escape that. Again, in political geographic scholarship, not so much in practice. I don't know much about the practice part of it, even though it's uh, part of my title. But in the scholarship, we have been trying to decolonize the Western idea of territory as a bounded uh, 
enclosed piece of land or piece of Earth's surface. There have been beautiful ideas coming up from looking at territory in a three-dimensional space, from looking at territory in a um, Latin American decolonial perspective, to looking at territory from a feminist geographical perspective. So there have been a number of ways to shift away from the understanding of territory as bounded space under the control of the group of people. So we are kind of trying to fit into that wave of decolonizing the idea of territory and see what Russian scholarly tradition can contribute to. And it can contribute qu quite a lot. The idea is the use of spatial vocabulary of soil, land, and terrain, and landscape. In Western academia, they're both they're all treated as separate, as separate entities. And in Russian scholarship, it all comes together to understand territory. So that's kind of the main difference, the main kind of scholarly difference that we have seen. And that's what we find so interesting uh, in the way Russia looks at it. Not as a set of different concepts, but as kind of a all one. Depends on political projects we want to legitimize. So yes, it's very much a disciplinary idea of the discipline of political geography, not so much the way it's practiced in different countries. That would be an another fascinating project to do. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Sonoma, well, thank you for being here today. Thanks. Very simple question. Uh, do you have a relationship with, or have you spoken at the George C. Marshall School for International Studies in Germany? No, I have a tight connection in terms of my research with Leipzig University, but not so much with um, them. It would be interesting to see what they do. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? All right, please join me in thanking Dr. Sonoma.